So first off, this video is quite long because there's just a lot to unpack here. You may see metronome and just think, oh, well, all you do is just press the A button and you're not wrong. There's just a bunch of context that exists within pressing that button. So let's get into it. The fact we've chosen Arceus specifically for this run was done purely out of the fact it has the best and most even base stats out of the entire roster. Its normal typing also plays a factor in terms of the effectiveness of the moves it will use and the fact it generally will take neutral damage from opponents fighting notwithstanding. So this run isn't about Arceus itself, it's about Metronome. Arceus is just a decent enough vehicle to attempt this run. So if you've been living under a rock, what is Metronome? Well, Metronome will randomly select any Pokemon move in the game and use it. There are a few exceptions to what move can be picked, but they're mostly more, I guess you could say, technical or status related moves. One turn, Arceus could be using an awesome move like Flamethrower, Next, it could go for Growl, and after that, it could even use a move like Lunar Dance or just Explosion. And those two moves crop up a lot more than you think, lower averages and all. Give or take, there are around 450 possible moves that we could use in this run, and I honestly think I saw every single one of them by the end of it. And the way we need to approach this run is a little different than others because it focuses more on what kind of moves we want to see at certain points in the battle and doing everything we can to survive just as long as possible. The nature of a run like this is that a lot of the time we're not attacking, we're too busy growling or layering or exploding. There are battles that would be trivial under any other circumstance but become an absolute brick wall when you leave them to RNG. So with that in mind, I tweak the rules that I usually use. So this is going to be a solo run, which means we can only use Arceus in battle, but we can capture other Pokemon for HM book purposes. We can't use items in battle, held items are fine. We'll of course be saving between the Elite Four. Finally, this was actually minimum battles all the way up to Lance, but we'll dig a little deeper into that nearer the time. All right, let's get this thing started. So first things first, Metronome is the only move we can use. When inserting Arceus with perfect IVs into the lead, I also made every single move slot contain metronome. This does nothing but clean things up so that you can only use that one move. And while I wouldn't be increasing the PP of the move until later on, battles eventually became so protracted that I had no choice but to basically give infinite PP to metronome. The other game is pretty easy because of Arceus's stats. It can tank damage really well and shrug off most of the low damaging moves that trainers will throw at you. Trainers also generally have fewer Pokemon at this point in the game, meaning you're not running out of PP before a battle ends. What you often find yourself doing is having to battle a trainer and then go all the way back to the center to heal your power points. It's annoying, but nowhere near as annoying as it would become pretty soon. While the city's Bellsprout Tower proves no issue despite having to go back and forth to heal our power points, I thought Bolt Note would be the real test of whether this run was viable, but we get surprisingly excellent luck with using Rollout in the very first battle. This had obviously set me up with a false sense of confidence for the rest of the run, just metronome, super effective moves, and everything will be a breeze. Oh yeah, because the explanations of some battles take some time, I'll just show the failed attempts in the run up to victory so you can just count how many times Arceus either explodes, uses Lunar Dance or some other terrible move like Splash. In Azalea Town, I tried to fight the rival first because we technically have just as much of a chance with him or Bugsy. Problem with the rival is that because we're normal, the only move that Ghastly can use is Spite and we hardly have enough metronome PP as it is. We're not exactly getting great luck with our first turns we do somehow get a Dragon Breath, which brings out the Zubat next. It's able to use Supersonic, which, while not as bad as other status moves we'll soon see, is just frustrating because it's another turn, potentially not attacking. And even when Bayleaf is sent out and we roll Flame Wheel, at our level, isn't even doing over half. Then Bayleaf starts setting up. This Pokemon was specifically chosen exactly because it is the most annoying thing. This thing has Reflect, Poison Powder, Synthesis, it was born to stall, but now the rival ain't happening, so I give Bugsy a shot. Giving Scyther any number of turns in battle is kind of the opposite of what you want to do. It's especially deadly because with combos of focus energy and U-turn, the bug will just straight up floor you without much trouble. What we'll see in battles further along is that in more challenging fights, you nominate a safe Pokemon that you can afford to take hits against in the hopes you roll moves like Amnesia, Swords Dance, Aquaring, any kind of move that ups your survivability. 
Typically, gym leaders start with their weaker Pokemon, but it's not like that for Bugsy. His ace is out first. U-turn does about a quarter to us, but it can work in our favor if Metapod is sent out because this Pokemon has tackle and harden. It is a great Pokemon to bide your time and wait it out for some good metronome look. Kakuna, not so much. Poison Sting is weak, but it will eventually poison us. Battles are so protracted that statuses like Poison and Burn are instant resets. Outside of absurd luck, you're just not surviving. For some perspective, a winning battle came around the 15-ish minute mark at 4 times speed. What's strange about the entire conceit of a metronome run is that you're a willing participant in what is called the illusion of control. The illusion of control is the tendency for people to overestimate their ability, in this case me, to control events. For example, when someone feels a sense of control over outcomes that they demonstrably do not influence. Each turn you are essentially throwing a 450 face die and willing it to land on a number that benefits you. It's like being at a roulette table, putting all your money on red 21 and projecting your will onto the ball as it spins around, reaching out with a disembodied hand to place it where you want. And you're doing that turn after turn thinking next time I'll get a good move. So you kind of got like a sunk cost fallacy there as well. It's concerning. Anyway, we start the battle against Scyther and it's quicker than us so it uses Leer and we respond with Bubble, which happens a lot. With our lower defense, U-Turn will do a ton, but Metapod is out next. Ideally, U-Turn would have been Scyther's first move, but here we are. Next, we roll Vacuum Wave, a fighting move and obviously resisted. We have Speed Metapod and go again, this time rolling Rock Slide. An excellent move, obviously, but I'd rather we'd had it for Scyther. We level up to 14 and I know Scyther's back out. With the level up, we're now quicker than it and end up using Rock Climb. Even with lowered accuracy, that is one of the best moves that we could hope for. But it's only doing around half and then the berry comes in to heal Scyther. Then it's confused, which it can do. And it ends up hitting itself in confusion. The very next turn, we roll Sing. Sleeping moves are some of the best moves we can hope for in this run. When this happens, you just spray and pray with Metronome. While we get Bubble Beam next, the very next turn after that, we get Flare Blitz absolutely destroy Scyther and we take a little recoil damage. So great, we have just one Pokemon left. Bad news, it's Kakuna, which has Poison Sting. If that procs, we're done. Well, it starts off a little strange. We throw up a barrier, meaning that Poison Sting, which barely does anything, somehow now does less. But I'm more worried about the poison, as if hearing that, we get a Leech Seed next turn. Okay, finally, on our third go at it, we come up with Rock Blast, a 25 Base power multi-hit rock attack, it gets the job done. Okay, we've gained a few levels, but the rival still has spite on his ghastly, so I'm thinking we'll be constantly resetting until we're able to knock this thing out first. And there's the Bayleaf too. Oh yeah, another annoying move to Metronome, aside from ones that outright knock us out, are ones like Heart Swap, Guard Swap, Power Swap, whatever. Basically anything that messes with our stats or exchanges stats with other Pokemon. Arceus is extremely powerful. Nothing has better stats in the game on the whole, vanilla wise. Us giving away our stats is an instant reset the majority of the time. The rival wasn't too much of a pain this time around though. Against the Ghastly, we get Rock Throw, which earns us an Oko. Our luck doesn't quite hold up right away against Zubat. It manages to get off Supersonic, so now we're confused on top of everything. We do, however, then pull out Mist Ball, a 90 base power psychic move that is the signature move of Latias. It's super effective and we've only lost 10 HP on the way to Bayleaf. Is it going to be enough? At first, it doesn't seem like it. We're rolling nothing effective and Bayleaf's happy to set up Reflect. Even when it's lost a bit of health, it'll just use Synthesis. A few turns later, we get Heat Wave, which doesn't quite do enough but takes it into Red Bar. Then Bayleaf uses Poison Powder, so we are really on a timer now. The very next turn, we get Smelling Salts, a 70 base power normal move that is a signature move of Hariyama and Makuhita. GG. Well, we are finally able to visit Goldenrod, still on minimum battles at this point too. I think we'll be okay because the Clefairy is quite weak and it gives us ample time to hope for some good metronome nut for the milk tank. Attract won't work against Arceus, leaving it with moves like Stomp, which can flinch, or Rollout, which can really rack up the damage. To my surprise, this battle took no time at all. I think maybe the second or third try we got some good luck. I have no idea how random Metronome truly is like. Do you have a greater chance of rolling a move like Tackle than you do say Fire Blast or is it truly random? I, I don't know. 
Against Clefairy, we start off really well with Flamethrower, though it only does just over half. Not having stab really sucks for a lot of these moves as well. However, after surviving a double slap, we use Dragon Claw the very next turn. I think everything's going well, but then we start seeing the problem with Pokemon that have the ability to heal themselves. In this case, it's Miltank's Milk Drink. Because we were so close after using Slam, but just couldn't go the distance soon, Miltank's back at full health, and I think we're going to get stomped to death. Instead, we first pull out a Vault Tackle, which ain't too effective. We then follow up with Weather Ball again, pretty pathetic, but Arceus finally pulls it out of the bag with High Jump Kick that destroys the Milky Tank. Okay, so in Ecru, nope, unfortunately, we hit a brick wall before reaching Ecruteak. I mentioned that running out of PP is a problem. Now, combine having 10 PP with doing battles against a naturally bulky Pokemon like a Clefable. Now, add another Pokemon, a Wigglytuff. Then, add another trainer that has the same Pokemon. So you're in a run of four Pokemon who are extremely bulky and you need to get past that battle with just 10 PP. Things start off better than usual with Poseid, which does some really decent damage. We can basically only afford to use 2 PP per Pokemon. Next turn, after double slap from Clefable, we get hit with Encore, the opposition just helping us out there. But then we get Stockpile, which is useless, before finally using Weather Ball. Now, for Wigglytuff, we don't start off too badly because we get Rock Smash. Then Wigglytuff goes for Disable. Oftentimes, this is a reset because Disable can last for several turns and our option is to struggle. Thankfully, while it doesn't take off a ton of HP from us, we've still got two Pokemon left and we are on just 38 HP. So when we roll into the next battle, this trainer starts off with the Wigglytuff first. Our first move takes it past halfway, which is all right, but then it uses Sing. Then Wigglytuff sets up a defense curl, exactly the kind of stalling tactics we don't want to see. But we soon wake up and use Signal Beam. We've just got enough XP to level up to 19 before the final Clefable comes out. We've got around 4 PP left right now. Our first move is Sludge, and then Clefable goes for Metronome and gets a much better attack in Flare Blitz. A couple of moves later, we respond with our own fire attack with Fire Punch and end the battle just terrible all round. Now we can finally reach Ecruteak and punish ourselves some more. The biggest issue with the rival aside from the Bayleaf is the Ghastly. It's got Curse. More so than a solo run, you better smash the reset button when this happens because you ain't lasting long. Man, in total, this battle took like half an hour or something. Even if you're making it past Ghastly, you've then got the Bayleaf waiting for you, just like it was in Azalea Town. It's got the ability to stall, poison you, regain each HP, and if you make it past Bayleaf, Zubat can then confuse you and Magnemite can then paralyze you. The plan often devolves into resetting on the first turn. Sometimes if you're lucky, Ghastly will use Bean Luck or another move that isn't Curse on its first turn. Can you imagine what it'd be like if multiple Pokemon were able to use Curse in one battle? How annoying would that be, eh? Thankfully, we don't have any battle like that coming up in our future. So let's say that you get through Bayleaf, you want to just hope that it holds off using Poison Powder for as long as possible. It tends to focus on setting up Reflect first turn, so you often get that just one chance. Maybe you can clutch out something like Refresh or a general healing move like Recover, but that hardly ever happens. What's worse about Bailey setting up defensive moves is that it often has plenty of warning to use Synthesis, so it's extremely difficult to get past. Oh yeah, and if you somehow make it past the Magnemite, you better hope you have the PP remaining from Metronome or you are screwed. Eventually, we get a break. It starts with us going first and using Ice Ball. Moves like this and Rolo are huge in this type of run. Ghastly uses Mean Look, perfect. The next Ice Ball will knock it out. And this move is like 90% accurate too. But I'm thinking of how much damage is this gonna do to Bailey? We end up leveling up to 21. Bailey will then come out. And are we gonna hit? Yes, we do. Ice Ball will definitely then one shot the Zubat too. But when it comes out, we end up missing. To be fair, we got more luck than we could have hoped for, but it's not over yet. We next roll Flame Wheel, which crits, knocking Zubat out. We're just left with Magnemite. It starts off well with Low Kick. At least it's super effective. Magnemite then uses Supersonic Frustrating, but not as bad as Thunder Wave. Next turn, no hit and confusion, but we get Gastro Acid, which nullifies the Pokemon's ability. And then we see the Paralysis. We're now paralyzed and confused but we somehow make it through the other end and use Water Pulse, knocking Magnemite out. I hated 
Morty's gym. It was awful. And what sucks is the first medium you battle in the gym. She has five ghastlies, all with curse. If we get hit with curse, we simply cannot win. We'd have to roll a recovery every other turn. And because we're normal, they'll use either spite or curse. None of these outcomes are good. I mean, technically spite is better because we're not losing health, but come on. Eventually, after ages, we managed to establish a good enough rhythm to get some decent moves. It's only on the final ghastly that we get curse, and even after that, we're able to pull out a clutch move and KO it. The rest of the trainers in Morty's gym aren't as annoying as that because they simply have fewer Pokemon, but then we've got Morty who technically has better Pokemon. Despite the odds being stacked against us with Morty, it's actually easier than that medium with the Ghastly. It took like two tries. The first turn against Ghastly, Arceus uses Dive, which will be a one-shot. Next up, instead of Gengar, we get Morty's Haunter. We throw up a Darude, which is pretty useless, and then get put to sleep immediately. While Gengar doesn't have Dream Eater, Haunter does. Our special defense is excellent so we can survive it well, and then wake up the next turn and use Special Rend, which doesn't quite knock Haunter out. However, that sandstorm I was moaning about a second ago actually finishes the job. Now, Morty fields the Gengar. Our first move ends up Sand Attack. Accuracy lowering moves are actually extremely useful in this kind of run too. We roll the dice and get Charge Beam next, also a decent move because of that special boost. But then we're snoozing again. Kind of pointless because Gengar doesn't have a move that can actually hit us, so we're stuck waiting until we finally wake up and then whip out a clutch Zap Cannon 70% accuracy to defeat it. Finally, Morty just has one Haunter left. Before it even gets to attack, we get a Dragon Pulse and end up Okoing the Haunter. It may seem like a better idea to avoid Chuck and instead go for Price or Jasmine, but with only two Pokemon, we actually may have a, I wouldn't say an easier, but potentially less stressful time. Let's start with Primate. It has double team. The longer the battle lasts, the more it can use this move, and we're just not hitting anything. It's not as bad as Smokescreen because that affects us, but it's still extremely annoying, especially when it can then use Focus Punch, and we're weak to fighting moves. At our level, Focus Punch from either Primate or Polyrath is a one shot. In theory, Polyrath's more dangerous because of its hypnosis, but at least it has other weaknesses to exploit, and we're certainly not doing ourselves any favours when half of our moves aren't attacking ones. Polyrath or Primate will have no problem using Focus Punch while we're busy using Splash or some utterly useless move RN Jesus has blessed us with. Best case scenario is that Primate sticks with something like Rock Slide while we hope to get some decent luck, but if you keep hitting your head against a wall, one of two things will happen. You'll break through that wall or you'll get a CTE like an American football player. It's probably both to be honest, but for now, I stop bashing my head against the wall and decide that Price and the rockets could provide us with some precious levels. Well, price wasn't happening either, so I decided to go all the way back to Chuck, a level or two higher, just to see if that gives us the edge. The battle starts extremely well by Arceus using Teleport, rivaled only in uselessness by Splash. Primeape uses Double Team. While the next turn, we use Rock Wrecker, which in most other circumstances would be a great move, right now it's awful. Not only is it resisted, but we have to recharge next turn. However, when we can attack next turn, Arceus makes up for using Teleport by using Air Cutter to finish Primate off. We are in a pretty good spot for Polyrath now. Our first turn, we get Bulk Up looking good, but then Polyrath uses Body Slam and we are paralyzed. We are now slower and Polyrath is charging up a Focus Punch. We'd have to KO it next turn, but no, nope, we use Hammer Arm. It does succeed in breaking Polyrath's focus, which is more than I could ask for. While it's setting up another focus punch, we use Gunk Shot and Chuck is finally defeated. I was in two minds about who to face next. Steel Pokemon just resist everything, especially in a run where more often than not, you're coming up with a weak attacking move that is then resisted. Gaining at least one more level can only work in our favor, so I decide to head back to Price. Previously, after getting whooped by Chuck, I'd given Price a go after cleaning out the rockets. I, well, it didn't go well, or else I would have shown it. As you might expect, the main sticking point with Price is his two Pokemon the Seal and the Dugong's ability to use Rest. In situations like this, even though the Pokemon do not particularly inflict a lot of damage, it's a death by a thousand cuts type situation. Every time you think about getting their HP low, they'll just rest. Then you have just two turns to take them out or you're right back at the start. One of the benefits of Rest, if we can view it as a benefit, is that this downtime, the opponent doesn't hurt us so much when we metro moves that may increase our own stats. Against Seal, it's typically tagging you with Icy Wind, 
While not damaging, it's low in our speed, so much so that invariably, Pokemon like Dugong or Piloswine will go first. Another annoying fact is they like to set up hail. There are two problems here. Number one, it's doing chip damage each turn, so we are effectively on a timer. Two, it means Blizzard skips the accuracy check. And along with Blizzard doing more damage than I'd like, it also has the chance to freeze. Once frozen, there's only a 25% chance we'll actually thaw out the next turn, so we are a sitting duck. To actually eke out a victory, it took about an hour, all told. When seals up, we start with Dragon Breath. Not terrible, because it can proc paralysis, and a move like that is often invaluable in these protracted battles. After Teal's Icy Wind, we come up clutch with a Leaf Blade that takes it out. Next, we get Piloswine, and extremely lucky. It's not hailing, so Blizzard isn't avoiding the accuracy check. We're at full health, and Piloswine's Blizzard practically shaves off half our health. We can't afford to take another one. Then we metronome roll out. Great, I guess, but we are done for. The next blizzard hits. First must have been a crit. Well, doesn't really matter because roll out hardly doing anything. It will do some work if it keeps hitting though, and blizzard keeps missing, and we keep hitting until Piloswine's defeated. Okay, are we gonna keep hitting Dugong too? It comes out, roll out hits, and it's super effective. I mean, some serious luck, but that's really all we've got. But unfortunately, Jasmine is next. I said about Steel generally resisting whatever you can throw at it. What makes it worse is that Jasmine's Magnemites also have Thunder Wave. Stats moves are a killer. We've now got a 50% chance to move at all. And most of the times, we're not even using an attacking move. The best we could do in a situation like this is equip a Berry to remove the Paralysis. But that's only good for one turn because Magnemite will always go for that Paralysis. If you somehow get past the Magnemite to the likes of Steelix, You've got that thing setting up Sandstorm, and now our HP is being shaved off 1 16th each turn. Perfect. The only saving grace to the battle is at least it's just three Pokemon. It's at this point where levels against opponent gym leaders have leveled off. Arceus can tank a hit extremely well, but because you're going so many turns without doing anything, it's in battles like this one where you have to establish a limit for each battle. How long am I going to keep rolling the dice before it's just not worth it? Usually, it's around the half HP mark for the first Pokemon because generally, if you haven't made either an attacking dent or rolled enough moves that put you in a better position going forward, it's not worth the effort. I say effort, it's literally pressing one button over and over again. I mean, mental effort then. Getting past Jasmine at four times speed ended up being about half an hour. We start the battle by rolling double team. Evasion raising moves like that and minimize often end up coming in pretty clutch. Then, instead of Thunder Wave, we get Thunder Bolt. Next turn, we respond with Cross Chop, basically the best move we could get in this situation. Jasmine often switches to Steelix, but because we're not paralyzed, I'm guessing she sent out the Magnemite. I was hoping for something, but it's Twister and no flinch. All right, there's Thunder Wave. We knew it was coming, but we have the Cherry Berry to heal it. On the very next turn, Lava Plume. Sweet. All right, we are in good shape. High HP, no paralysis, but Steelix can hit hard. What are we going to get? Light Screen. Useless as Steelix is a physical attacker, but it always goes Sandstone first turn. Next turn, we whip out Confuse Rate, a solid move that's bought us some time. Steelix then hits itself in Confusion. After that, we are back to Trash with Aeroblast barely doing anything. Steelix then does us a favor and misses with its attack, but then comes the Ice Ball, the icy brother of Rollout. We could be in business here. If we don't miss, and if Steelix isn't able to knock us out, it may just see us through. And despite Steelix trying to attack, that double team from before, paired with Iron Tail's lower accuracy, means it ain't touching us. Little by little, Ice Ball, though it's resisted, is gradually doing more and more damage each turn. It's also not putting Steelix in a healing range, so in the end, with a crit Ice Ball, we finish the battle. I was not prepared for the next battle. If you were to ask me which trainers were in the top three in terms of time taken to defeat them, I would not have chosen this guy in a million pokey years. I usually gloss over the rocket section, but this dude was somehow a perfect storm of the worst conditions you could have in a run like this. It's like he was crafted to test my sanity. So normally doing the rocket side quest, you clear out the building before getting the key card by fighting the guy masquerading as the head of the company or whatever he is. This dude has a total of six Pokemon. Six Poison Pokemon. Six Poison Pokemon with the Levitate ability. There are five Coughing and a Wheezing, by the way. Alongside their Typing and Ability, they possess two killer moves. 
Smokescreen and Sludge Bomb or some kind of poison attacking move. Sludge maybe. The Weezing has self-destruct too. Firstly, six Pokemon is a lot to deal with. Without having infinite PP, this thing is damn near impossible because these Pokemon, first and foremost, want to lower your accuracy. They will keep using Smokescreen until your accuracy is non-existent. Typically, this happens on the very first Pokemon. So even if you defeat the coughing, you have five Pokemon remaining and the chances are you won't hit any of them. Then you've got poison thrown into the mix. If you're poisoned, chances are the attempt's over. You may get a recovery move or refresh, but it's so rare, it's not worth thinking about. On top of that, there's also the fact that you have six Pokemon constantly chipping away at your HP each turn. Arceus's stats are good, but this is a minimum battles run right now, so we're only a couple of levels above his Pokemon. I was on this battle for, I kid you not, five hours, probably more, hundreds of battles. It was at this point I should have done a TAS or had a macro or auto fire or something. I mean, normal runs are a waste of time, sure, but this one's breaking records. Against Rocket Leader Petrel or whatever his name is, I'd set up a few ground rules for this battle. Number one was having a berry to combat the poison. That's basically our mulligan. We don't want to get poison ever. And if it happens on the first Pokemon, you might as well just reset. And Sludge has a 30% chance to poison too, which sucks. There were times when I'd get poisoned, heal, and then immediately get poisoned again the next turn. Oh yeah, and that levitate ability basically precludes a chunk of ground moves from working, which sucks because then the wheezing and coughing are only really vulnerable to psychic unless you get gravity or something like that. Ice ball or rollout look doesn't help us here either. These moves already have a lowered accuracy and while they're powering up, we're still getting hit with smokescreen, so they eventually miss. Like, this entire battle is a touch grass moment, seriously. And the fact that it was possible is... I don't know what to think about that, because technically this guy isn't even what you'd call a hard battle, so in what way, shape or form, do we achieve victory? It starts with air slash one-shotting the first coughing before it gets to poison us or lower our accuracy. Now we get the wheezing. Hilariously, our first turn gives us heal order at full HP, happens a ton. Weezing hits us with a smoke screen. I wasn't feeling too confident. We'd been here a thousand times before. When we get tail glow, I had kind of checked out. Our special attack's been raised sharply, but it doesn't matter if we can't hit anything. Another smoke screen, and then when we can actually perform a decent move in ice beam, we of course miss. Our accuracy is getting lower, but then we somehow roll ice beam again, and this time it hits. Don't know what the odds of that are. That's two Pokemon down and we're at decent HP. Still got four remaining though. Of course, coughing is hell bent on lowering our accuracy even further before we eventually pop off and hit with Octazooka. Okay, okay, one more down. It's when the next coughing's out that it finally decides to start attacking. While our crab hammer doesn't do terrible damage, we need something better than that. Just so happens we get Crush Grip, the signature move of Regigigas. It does more damage the higher HP a target has so it's probably around 60 base power when we get it off. Just two Pokemon remaining. Even though we've taken all those smoke screens, we're still hitting, and the trend continues with us getting a stomp on the next coughing, causing a flinch. Then Arceus pulls out Powdered Snow to knock out the penultimate Pokemon. Only one coughing remains. I had gotten this far before, a handful of times, even on higher health. The combo of poison and missing Sedan much will tear through your HP, so at this point, I wasn't getting my hopes up. Our first attack misses, smoke screen. Our second attack then misses, another one. Finally, we hit with rock smash. I'm just hammering the confirm button. We keep reeling through trash moves, get poisoned and then recover until finally, finally, we get Draco Meteor. And boom, it's done. A great coffin shaped weight has been removed from my shoulders. And oh god, it's the rival again. I'd forgotten about him. It's kind of the same deal as before. However, he'll lead with Golbat this time, which is a decent enough Pokemon to set up on. What was Bayleaf is now Meganium. It still retains the same moveset as before, Reflect, Synthesis, Poison Powder, but instead of Razor Leaf, it's got Petal Dance. The good thing about this move is that it will confuse the Meganium after two or three turns. However, it's still as big a pain in the ass as ever. What's also annoying about this battle is you have to decide which status you care more about. Do you want Bailey to poison you or do you want Magnemite to paralyze you? Ideally, neither, but what's a real spiritual kick to the nuts is that his final Pokemon is a Haunter and it has Curse. So after you have somehow made it all the way through his team to only be met with Curse sapping your already low health, it's rather demoralizing. But we kind of spoke about how much of a pain in the ass this guy is, so we can just kind of breeze through the battle. Like it took over an hour, but still, 
Okay, so against Gobat, we pop off a layer, kind of trash. Then there's Confuse Ray, fantastic. A turn or two later, we actually get Ancient Power, no boost, which is a real shame. But the turn after that, we're the ones confusing Golbat for a change. It ends up hitting itself in confusion, but not quite knocking itself out. However, next turn, we get a move that made this battle possible, Ingrain. It's going to restore some HP each turn. It's nature's budget leftovers. If this is paired with boosting your stats, you are golden. But Golbat's knocked itself out and we're on to Meganium. Our double slap actually does a decent amount of damage before it sets up Reflect, which it tends to do turn one. Then it either goes for Poison Powder or Petal Dance. Obviously, we'd rather see the latter. Unfortunately, Meganium's stally nature comes right to the forefront and this thing can stall. We're just burning through turns while it's healing and we are hardly doing anything for ages. We get the paralysis off at one point, which is always helpful, and Ingrain is just keeping us in the game. Like, it's ridiculous how long it drags on. Every time it's nearing low HP, hey, there's Synthesis. Eventually, after I do not know how many turns, we finish it off with a double hit. Great. Only three Pokemon left. And of course, it's Magnemite next, which means we're getting paralyzed and confused. We do the dance for a few turns until coming up with Egg Bomb, which ends up being a one-shot. The rival will then field the Sneasel next. Can't do a whole lot against us and it's a weak Pokemon, so for a change, it's actually pretty easy. Oh, and how we have not rolled a ridiculous move like Explosion or Lunar Dance with all this back and forth, which is always lurking in the back of my mind, is insane. But now we have Haunter and we can't ingrain our way out of this one. Of course, we are now slower too. Haunter goes first. There is Curse. We absolutely have to get rid of this thing. And to do that, we have Smokescreen. Our HP is ticking down. Haunter can't attack us. Ingrain may just give us one more turn if we're lucky then we end up getting confused but next turn we don't hit ourselves in confusion we roll magma storm and it is enough to land us a victory with all the rocket shenanigans completed we can finally head to blackthorn and face claire battling her gives us somewhat of an indication of how we're going with lance later except he's a lot tougher and this battle is extremely difficult so gyarados is the first problem we'll face which will actually become easier when we're fighting lance for reasons we'll cover later its intimidate ability is never great but it's not the end of the world. What's worse is Dragon Rage. With set damage moves, in this case 40, our great defenses are redundant. It also puts us on a pseudo timer to defeat Gyarados. At our current level of 38 with 153 HP, the fourth Dragon Rage will knock us out. This means that Gyarados can't be our setup Pokemon. We need this thing out of the picture as soon as possible so that we have a decent enough health pool for the rest of the team. Another annoyance on top of all this is that with our lower attack and generally low attacking output, it gives Claire ample time to heal the Gyarados with a Hyper Potion, taking us right back to the start. If that's not enough, on the occasions we make it past Gyarados, we'll then get one of Claire's Dragonair. Problem here is that they have Thunder Wave and we'll go for that move first turn. Now, we won't outspeed any of her Pokemon in addition to having a 50-50 chance of attacking. It just keeps getting better. In theory, the first Dragonair is the Pokemon where we can afford to ride things out a little. Its moves don't cause a ton of damage, so the way the battle usually goes is that I'll give Metronome two turns in order to come up with a decent move to knock Gyarados out. Then, when Dragonair's out, it's a given we're getting paralysed, but we can afford to waste some turns hoping we're blessed with RNG. However, on occasion, we'll come up with a clutch move and defeat this Dragonair first, only to then be greeted with Claire's Kingdra. Depending on our HP, Kingdra may outright attack us with a move like Hydro Pump, or it'll just try to keep reducing our accuracy with Smokescreen. Neither are particularly great options. By now, our levels are lower than the opponent's Pokemon, and while we have better stats, levels really do start to matter a lot at this point in the game. Moves like Hydro Pump will shave off around a third of our HP too, so we're never really in a position to tank those moves well. The ideal scenario is that we deal with Gyarados quickly, set up a little on Dragonair that then provides us with enough survivability with Stan Kingdra's attacks and make it through the remainder of the battle. All we can do is try, try and try again and that's exactly what we did for several hours. This was the battle where I had to make a decision and do a little mental forecasting to the road ahead. At our current level this ain't happening. I'll have no choice but to use the rare candies I've gathered so far. With this in mind Lance won't be possible without us gaining further levels outside of minimum battles so just keep that in mind. Anyway, the magic number is level 43. For Gyarados, we start things off by taking an Intimidate. Then we roll 
with a Thunder Punch. Even with our reduced attack, I'm assuming it's physical disgen, it manages to one-shot Gyarados. That's huge. Claire then sends out our setup Dragonair. What are we going to get? Well, first off, it's Sword Stance. That's pretty awesome. We're now at plus one attack and it could be a game changer. Of course, we've been paralyzed, meaning that Dragonair goes first with Dragon Pulse, but it's not doing a great deal of damage anyway. After hitting Dragonair with Psy Wave, we eventually roll a Horn Attack, which ends up freeing. At 124 HP, we're in a good, not great position for Kingdra. I've been here before and the next few moves are going to be crucial. Kingdra's out. It goes first and misses with Hydro Pump. That is a big win for us. But then we're paralyzed, so it's useless. Okay, then there's another Hydro Pump miss. Real lucky, and we follow it up with Psycho Cut Crit. That's a 70 base power physical psychic move. Kingdra has its berries, so I'm hoping it's taken out of healing range. It is. And then there's another Hydro Pump miss. This is crazy good luck. I'm getting nervous because we have never been in a situation like this before. Next turn, we roll Dig. If it hits, it should defeat Kingdra, but we could be paralyzed, remember? Kingdra used Hyper Beam, which is useless. But we're not paralyzed, spring up, and we hit, and Kingdra's down. Now we just have one Pokemon remaining, and we are on extremely decent health. When Dragon has sent out, it goes first with Dragon Pulse, which isn't doing much, but we don't want to take a lot of those. We then hit with Mist Ball, doing just under half. Another Dragon Pulse causes our Citrus Berry to kick in, extremely important to have that, and when we get a Fire Spin, it's pretty useless. Next turn, you guessed it, Dragon Pulse. But then we roll Perish Song. We now basically have a few turns to wrap this thing up, or it's all for nothing. We take another hit, and what are we going to get? Dark Pulse, it hits, and that's a KO, and we've done it. As those familiar with Heart Gold Soul Silver will know, before the Elite Four, we've got the Kimono Sisters standing in our way. This battle is a pain because while you do fight six Pokemon in a row, it's staggered, so it is essentially six separate battles. The Sisters Pokemon have the annoying synchronizability, meaning that if you inflict a status ailment, that will then become your status ailment too. So what advantage that we could have had has now vanished. Not only that, but if we were to get an excellent run of status buffs, they would vanish when the battle is over. Something that has been extremely important in battles that last for longer. On the plus side, if we can call it that, the evolutions can't inflict a ton of damage, but it will chip away at our health. The other annoyance comes from Pokemon like Flareon, which can use Will of the Wisp to burn us, lowering our attack and shaving off some HP each turn. For the Pokemon, Umbreon's bulky, which means it always takes a number of turns to knock it out, and even super effective moves don't inflict too much, even though we're a few levels above them. And while Umbreon can't do much, Espeon's Psychic can stack up, especially when your special defense is dropping. We've already covered Flareon and its annoying burn, the Jolteon, it's got double team, always frustrating, and Vaporeon is kind of meh and a much better Pokemon to end on than the others. But, but over an hour later, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But Umbreon, we start off the battle with Sing, which is awesome. But in these situations, it's always about what we're able to do during those moments. Our first move misses, but then we roll close combat, which is honestly one of the best moves we could pull. Then, the very next, after taking Umbreon down a chunk of HP, we get Rock Smash and finish it off. So, first battle down, no damage taken, pretty flawless. Couldn't have asked for more. The next battle is against the Espeon. At our level, we will outspeed it. Petal Dance can be good if it's doing a good chunk of damage. Doing over half is definitely that, meaning it'll be a two-hit KO. Again, really solid battle, but we'll be seeing Flareon next. It loves to burn us, which is a run killer. However, we pull an Aeroblast out of the bag, which not only hits, but ends up breaking. Three Pokemon down, and Metronome has not failed us so far. There's a Jolteon and a Vaporeon remaining who may have something to say about that though. Let's keep it going. Against the Jolteon, we roll first and get takedown. The recoil, I'm not worried about, but I'm surprised we managed to one-shot the thing, which is awesome. We're on more than half HP, and there is a Citrus Berry equipped just in case. Only Vaporeon is standing in our way. Okay, we get an Ember first, probably the worst move imaginable. Then we're hit by Surf. Honestly, that's doing a fair bit of damage, but it activates the berry, so we gain some health back. Metronome gives us an ominous wind. It's got a 10% chance of boosting our stats, but we don't get it. Man, this thing is bulky. 83 HP. What are we getting next? Return at max friendship. That's 102 damage. No complaints there. It's over. There's not too much to say about the prep for the Elite Four, aside from doing some rock smashing to get a number of berries we might need, as well as picking up whatever rare candies remain in Johto. Unlike other runs where held items that increase your damage with a certain elemental move are useful, we're more focused on anything that can replenish our HP or cure a status ailment. Leftovers would have been god tier from the start of this run, but we are stuck waiting for that until a little ways through Kanto. 
With that said, let's talk about Will. For every battle until Lance, we have been playing this as a minimum battles run. As I said before, the book stops at Lance, unfortunately. While I had to lose and level up later, spoiler, I was able to get through the Elite Four at minimum battles, and it was a challenge, to say the least. Will's Pokemon have a ton of annoying moves that make this battle, well, annoying. But technically, the easiest out of the bunch. His Zartu have Confuse Ray, which we can't do anything about, as well as U-Turn and Psychic, but we can tank those moves pretty well. Jinx obviously has Lovely Kiss, which will put us to sleep. A Pokemon like Executor has Reflect, Leech Seed, Instant Reset, and Hypnosis. And for Slowbro, it's got Amnesia and Curse, which are awful for us. Though we do have quite a good number of levels on his team, a Psychic from the lowest level Zartu maybe does about 1-8, and that's one of his weaker mons. And a successful battle took around 15 minutes. When we roll into battle with the first Zartu, we get basically one of the best moves we can get with Night Slash, a one-shot. But Jinx is up next, and it's going to want us to catch some Zs. We shoot first with Toxic, but then it, of course, uses Lovely Kiss. But while we're asleep, Toxic may do some of the work for us. We luckily wake up the next turn after tanking a hit and then use Dragon Rush. With Jinx's poor defense, that's an Oko. Will then pivots to his Executor. The first move out of the hat is Gravity, which is useless. Then Executor gets a crit Psychic. I have an Iapa Berry to heal us. It's not as good as a Citrus Berry, but I'm still saving those. And the very next turn, we roll a Mega Horn, which is of course a one shot. Pretty good so far. Two Pokemon remaining. The Slowbro, we kick things off with a Flame Wheel. Awful. There's that Amnesia. This may take a while. We go back and forth a little until we come up with a Thunderbolt, which nearly, nearly knocks it out. And it will's going to heal, which after all these curses and amnesias is seriously a pain in the ass. I can't tell you how many times in the game we were getting awesome moves that would just leave the opponent on a sliver of health. We just sat there hammering confirm after Haze came along and cleared everyone's stats, leaving Slowbro to settle once again. We do get slack off to restore some HP, which is always nice. Then Outrage comes along, so we're stuck into that for several turns. Even though it's 90 base power, it's barely doing anything, but is taking Slowbro closer to Red Bar. After that, we clutch out a Sing, despite that we're barely getting anything good while it's snoozing until ending on Bounce. I feel like Andy Dufresne in The Shawshank Redemption, chiseling a stone wall with some tiny pick. A Dragon Claw brings it all so close, and then hilariously, the move that finishes off Slowbro ends up being Constrict. God. Alright, just Zartu left, and it starts well with Fire Punch. Zartu number 2 has a Berry, so it's back across halfway. We suffer a Confuse Ray, but manage to come out the other end with Blast Burn, a 150 base power fire move that burns Zartu up, and that's Will. Koga as a ninja is a master of underhanded tactics apparently. The frustration with Koga comes in a number of forms. His first Pokemon, Ariados, can cause trouble with Poison Jab. It obviously has a chance to poison you, and though we have a berry to counteract this, we're saving it for another Pokemon. This is our first point of reset. If Ariados poisons us, try again. If and when we defeat Ariados, which isn't hard because it's pretty weak, you'll get Fortress. This thing, despite being spherical, is a double-edged sword. Like Jasmine, the majority of moves will barely touch it. However, all it has is Protect, which it loves to use, and Swift, which barely causes any real damage. It's obviously got Explosion, which we don't want to see. However, by the nature of our moves, we're always walking that tightrope the more and more we damage this thing. It's like playing that kid's game where you pull the teeth from a crocodile. But because Fortress can tank a ton of damage, it's actually a great Pokemon to bide your time on and hope for some good setup moves because we'll need every advantage for the next Pokemon, Muck. For this purple blob, we want it out of the picture as soon as possible. It's got Minimize, thankfully only upping its evasion and not lowering our accuracy. Still, it's super annoying because it will simply keep setting up until it is near impossible to hit. It also has Sludge Bomb, which is the most damaging move out of every one of Koga's Pokemon. Arceus can't survive several of these. It's even worse if we're poisoned by this move or, even worse, we get hit with Toxic. Ideally, we'd rather all our luck comes in for this Pokemon. Oftentimes, it doesn't. Then you've got Venomoth and Crobat. Venomoth was never a problem as it's quite weak and vulnerable. In this version of the game, Crobat doesn't have Toxic, nor are its moves particularly damaging. I considered a run viable if we were able to get past the hurdle that is Muck and nothing before that. As has become the story so far, we are spending about an hour on some troubles and battles, and double, triple, or quadruple that on difficult fights. When Ariados is out, this time, Comet Punch starts off the battle. It's not terrible and does take Ariados past half, 
only for it to use spiderweb, which is useless. Next turn, we crack open an ice beam, which is definitely finishing it off. I come in to the battle with Fortress thinking, much like the other battles, this is going to take forever. We're not really breaking out any great attacks, nor buffing ourselves. We get a fire spin at one point, which deals a fair bit of pain, but I'm not surprised when Koga eventually decides to heal Fortress. I tuned out for a second right before Arceus clutches it out with Lava Plume and one shots Fortress. We've got a bit of a run on our hands now, but we've not effectively buffed ourselves, so I'm worried about what's going to happen with Muk. Our first move, Mud Slap's decent, so I'll take that. Then Muk starting the minimizes, and my eyes are rolling so far back into my head that they have dropped down my throat and are busy pinballing around my insides. Oh, yeah, and Muk can heal itself each turn with its black sludge or poison orb or whatever it has. We get a sacred fire off and proc a burn, which is pretty sweet, but there's that full restore. Or not, I guess it got used up. After an amnesia and not taking any damage, I think, the burn knocks it out. Probat's fielded and we roll a sword stance, always a welcome move to use. Then there are the double teams from Crobat and we get off a poison jab, which is pretty funny. A turn later, after taking some damage, we get synthesis and are basically near full health with two Pokemon left. This is when I am starting to believe. However, my belief begins to waver when we are just turning up the most useless resistant moves in existence. Yet, yeah, there's a recovery in there, which we needed, but like Muck, it's finished off by its burn, leaving just Venomoth. That Razor Wind hits Venomoth with good damage and Psychic ain't too effective. Then, to my surprise, we get a Magnitude 8, which I always assume won't hit because it's Venomoth. Well, it has wings, and that's kind of it, pretty painless. Bruno, though, there's a dude I was worried about. Being normal type, we're weak to fighting, his Pokemon fighting type, aside from Onyx, but they can easily destroy us. Cross drop from a champ could be a one shot for all I know. Hypnotop's a weird one. What's good is that it often uses counter and the offer don't directly attack, so it's wasted a turn and we've potentially buffed ourselves. Its other moves like Dig all do barely anything, so if we play our cards right, like have any impact on this, that's our designated set of Pokemon. What also works is that Bruno will use a full restore on the Hypnotop, which can save it from being used on a champ, I think. Bruno will field the Hitmon Lee next. Its high jump kick actually doesn't do that much damage, all things considered. That's the bonus of having perfect IVs and being the master of space and time, or whatever Arceus is. Our HP can still get chipped away, of course, and it can use Swagger. I'd equip a berry just for that, though, because it could actually help us out in the long run. But then there's the roadblock that is Machamp. If you're not over half HP or have some good buffs, it'll just wipe you out. Even if you're surviving, you'll have taken at least two cross chops and still have hit one Chan and Onyx to defeat. It's not just getting past a roadblock, but recognizing when you're in good enough shape to survive the remainder of the fight. For hit one Chan, you've just got to be careful that its elemental punches don't proc a status effect. And for Onyx, its most dangerous move is probably Sandstorm because it does fix damage each turn. However, despite having the clearest advantage against us, Big Bruno was actually quicker than both Will and Koga, if you can believe that. In the winning battle, we start with Nightshade. Not terrible, but then hit on top uses Dig. Can we take advantage of this? Absolutely. We use Shadow Force, a 120 power physical ghost move that is the signature move of Giratina. That's going to finish off Hitmon Top, no problem. Obviously, we've got to pay the penalty for a decent move with a trash one, Teleport. But then Hitmon Lee uses Swagger and we have the Lumberry equipped, a great held item for this kind of run. We then fight Fire with Fire and use Brick Break. It's not resistant and we're at plus two attack, so it'll wipe the floor with Hitmon Lee. Okay. But here is the real challenge. What are we going to get from a champ? First off, withdraw. And it's not looking great. That's maybe about a third of our HP. Next turn, Arceus is making up for that with Grass Whistle, which puts it to sleep. We have to capitalize on the situation. Well, our first move is Splash, so not quite what I was hoping for. Next turn, though, Power Whip Crit. 120 base power Grass move. We'll take it every day of the week. Things are coming up Millhouse. But Onyx, we do end up stumbling a little. We're not rolling great moves. Onyx sets up Sandstorm, we may be on a timer again because it's also damaging us with Earthquake. However, Arceus digs deep and pulls out Aura Sphere. It's super effective and Onyx is down. Just a Hitmonchan left. We are on good enough HP. I don't know if it's quite good enough yet. There's Sandstorm chip damage again, but we roll another Grass Whistle and this could be it. What have we got? Confuse Ray. Well, I guess that could be helpful. It hits itself in Confusion, so I guess it did. Then there's Leech Life, a little bit of HP back. Arceus then uses Nightshade. Our health's getting a little low. Just one more move though, and full restore. Back to square one. But then there's Iron Head. One shot, Dunzo. 
three out of four trainers defeated at minimum battles. I honestly didn't know if it was possible, but Arceus, Metronome, and slowly destroying my sanity was obviously worth it. Karen was a bit of an unknown. We know Umbreon's bulky, it lacks sand attack like it had in Gen 2, still, it pulls the reverse sand attack with double team. Not to mention, it's got Confuse Ray as well. If we've got that Lumberry equipped, it's gonna prop there instead of where we actually need it, which is on the Vile Plume Stun Spore. One positive thing is that Gengar doesn't have Curse, but it does have Destiny Bond, though it doesn't like to use it. And yet, there's Focus Blast, but it's not too powerful. Her Ace Houndoom loves to set up Nasty Plot first turn and then pivot to Flamethrower, and that'll do work on us. All things considered, we're in a better position than, say, Bruno. Kind of like with the Kimono Sisters Umbreon, there's a potential to set up on it and then see how it goes with the rest, though, there's no guarantee. Karen always switches to Gengar next, and it'll like to use Focus Blast because that's all it's got, really. Oftentimes, we're making it to Hound Do. As you might expect, we'll see a nasty plot and then either Dark Pulse or Flamethrower, which is often a KO. Getting beyond that, while rare, is nowhere near our previous battles. In fact, I spent like 20 minutes on Karen. For the Umbreon, we kick off with a Brave Bird, which does less than half. We're then confused, but the Lumberry comes in, so it's kind of a waste. However, next turn, we start balling. So we're taking damage from Umbreon, we finish it off with a third turn rollout. I have no doubt Gengar comes out and we hit, it's a one shot. Gengar's out, we hit Oko. And this thing will destroy Houndoom, no problem too. We just need to get past the level up and ignore learning gonna move and we can see if we hit the mark. The ace is out, we hit, and to add insult to injury, it is a crit too, not that it mattered. Rollout's ended now and we've got two Pokemon left. We were tanking an awful lot of hits from Umbreon, so our health situation ain't great for Murkrow. We're outputting some damage, but so is it. Then Karen ends up healing the bird, but we whip out a heal order and gain back a nice chunk of HP. Murkrow then decides to do us a favour by continually hitting itself in the beak while we're just missing or using useless moves. It gets to a point where Murkrow's on a sliver of health, and then Arceus goes ham and uses Hyper Beam like, I appreciate the effort, but now we're gonna have to recharge the Vile Plume, and it's definitely gonna paralyze us. As predicted, we are paralyzed. Then Vile Plume's switching to Petal Dance. The only saving grace is that it'll eventually get confused. Unless we get some kind of clutch move or heal, we won't survive. The Poke Gods hear our plea and deliver us in grain, so we'll recover a little bit of HP each turn. And that may just be enough. We are bringing things right down to the wire, especially when Vile Plume scores a crit with Petal Dance, and we're getting paralyzed every other turn. However, right as things are getting close, Arceus rolls a Mega Punch, and that is enough to defeat Vileplume. With Karen defeated, that's as far as we can go. Not in the run, obviously. I was far too stunned for that. But it's as far as we can go with minimum battles. Like, I'm not saying that it's impossible, it's just the time it would take for it to happen at our current level would be astronomical. I don't know if you could even RNG manipulate the outcomes. But let me explain the kind of odds that are stacked against us. First off, Lance's team is super powerful. They're all aces in theory. Extremely powerful trolley Pokemon where each one doesn't have trouble defeating us. This is Claire on steroids. We've seen Gyarados. We know what it's capable of. You've got Intimidate, but not Dragon Rage this time. Instead, it likes to use Waterfall. This works in our favor because it becomes our setup Pokemon. We want a number of things to happen with Gyarados to make this fight viable in the long run. An obvious point is having Lance use one of his full restores on Gyarados. That helps. Other general good stuff is buffing our stats or bringing our attack stat back up or even higher. Bonus points if you whip out an Aqua Ring or an Ingrain. Half HP becomes the rule of thumb for the fight. If we're in a good enough position, having fulfilled a number of those good conditions, the battle is worth rolling with. And this wasn't something I realised on the first several dozen battles. It's extremely difficult to get information because you're not consistently making it past the first Pokemon. If and when Gyarados is defeated, the level 50 Dragonite is next. First turn, it loves Safeguard. That gives us one free hit, but then it starts using Outrage. We can survive one or two hits, that's it. We're at level 50, we're just not bulky enough with no stat buffs. And the kicker is, if you make it past the level 50 Dragonite, chances are you're not in great condition and four Pokemon remain. Because you'll get the Dragonites with Thunder Wave next, and you can bet they're out to paralyze you. Oh yeah, and these Dragon Pokemon tend to resist quite a bit of stuff too, did you know that? So we've got lowered attack and resisted moves. At one point I thought maybe the only path through this was rollout or ice ball. The odds of getting those moves is like well 1 in 450 or something like that. But that's not enough because starting up rollout needs to be in a situation where you've got good attack and the second one takes out Gyarados so that you can blitz through the remaining Dragonite. 
and it's 90% accurate, by the way. I mean, it's easy to see how insane the confluence of luck needed for this to be a thing that is possible, right? I feel like you could write a statistics paper on this or some kind of psychological evaluation dissertation. All right, let's see a win. And I'm using my rare candies or have gone and leveled up along the way for some context. Okay, we are level 54. First move is Curse, which is pretty awesome. We're doing decent damage when we attack, and Gyarados really can't do a lot to us either. A few important events happen here. One is that we get Lance to use that for Restore. Another big win is that we eventually use Aqua Ring. Now we'll be getting a little bit of health back each turn, which is really awesome. We mess around for a couple of turns after that until we roll Synthesis, taking us back to nearly full health. I'm cautiously optimistic at this point. What we see now is that the damage from Gyarados and Aqua Ring are just about evening each other out, so we can afford to waste those turns and bide our time. Slowly, we're whittling Gyarados down. Eventually, we get Night Slash and knock it out. Now, it's the level 49 Dragonite. Lance sometimes does this. I think it depends on our health. It means we are going to get paralyzed. Can't really do anything about that. While we can heal with the Lumberry, it really doesn't matter unless we knock it out, and that doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. While Dragon Rush can miss, it tends not to, and it's slowly causing more pain than Aqua Ring can heal. Then Arceus pulls out a move, and I don't know if it's Insanity or 40 Chess, but it's Belly Drum, Max Attack. Dragon Rush then misses. Arceus uses Crush Grip, KO. I'm thinking we're in it now. Best position we've been in so far, level 50 Dragonite. We know Safeguard's coming, but what are we gonna get? An attack? Nope. Milk drink. That is huge. We are basically on full HP. Next move is Doom Desire. I'd rather we attack, but okay. But we're tanking Outrage really well. We end up boosting our special defense next turn. Soon, Dragonite's confused because of Outrage. We use Torment. Come on, come on, just give us a physical move. A any physical move. We are max attack. We just keep using special moves or ones that have other ways of getting their damage calcs. Super frustrating. Until finally, there's Drill Peck. The level 50 Dragonite is down. Level 49 one next. What are we getting? Don't know. We're outsped and it uses Thunder Wave. That sucks. What's worse, we're getting paralyzed every couple of turns. And when we do attack, it's not enough. Damage is starting to take its toll and we can't keep up with healing. We're on 99 HP when Arceus whips out Dizzy Punch, giving us the KO. Two Pokemon left. It's Charizard. It's quicker than us. It's using Air Slash. It's doing a little too much damage. We're either flinching or we're paralyzed. Then we end up getting Sunny Day. It's like we want this thing to win. Of course, there's a Fire Fang from Charizard. We are on 58 HP before the heal. We use High Jump Kick. It hits and it somehow KOs Charizard. Wow, one Pokemon left. Aerodactyl, make or break time. Okay, it's out. We're on low HP. How much is Rock Slide doing? Not great. We can tank a few maybe, but then we pull out a Roost. Edge of my seat right now. Like, we just need a few good moves. Arceus answers with Frenzy Plan. It nearly takes it to Red Bar. We'll have to recharge, but that's fine. We've got a ton of HP. Just give us a good move. Aerodactyl will get two rock slides in. Barely doing anything. All right, what are we going to get? Self-destruct. Self-destruct. Out of all the moves, self-destruct. My head was in my hands. If I didn't laugh, I would cry. We were this close. I had to go and touch some grass. That was the last draw. I had to level up. I didn't care. I wasn't going through that again. Okay, here it is for realsies this time. There's not a ton to say about Gyarados, except that we do pull off some good moves, specifically Ingrain. We also do a number of things like proc that for restore use. Then it's just a case of going back and forth for ages until we finally defeat Gyarados. Instead, the level 49 Dragonite, it's the level 50. And honestly, compared to that other battle where we were just 10 levels lower, we're actually doing worse. I was thinking this wasn't going to amount to anything, but after a few turns of taking quite a fair bit of damage, we pop off an Ancient Power and get that boost. This is when I actually start paying attention, but there's a level 49 Dragonite out next. We're definitely getting paralyzed. We've got the Lumberry, but it's just delaying the inevitable. Plus, our HP is not great, but we could put you out. All right, I keep going, not getting great moves until Ice Ball, but it's like 90% accurate and we're paralyzed. What can we really expect? Well, we do get a crit against Dragonite and KO it. We won't go first against the other one, but as long as it doesn't flinch and we're paralyzed. All right, let's keep going. We're then rewarded with Grass Whistle. Awesome. We can get some HP back. Next turn, there's a Sword Stance. Even better. And then the very next turn, Outrage. Wow. Lance will send out Charizard next. If we're not paralyzed, I think it can KO. 
Charizard's out, it goes first, no flinch, Outrage hits. That is a one shot, just Aerodactyl left. This part of the battle does not go well. We are confused, paralyzed, and up against a move that can cause flinch. We are basically not going to be attacking anytime soon, and we don't. And when we do, we just hit ourselves in confusion. This goes on for a little while until we roll uproar. That could be useful, but it's just not doing enough damage. So, as you might have guessed, when its health gets low enough, there's the full restore. Arceus is just kind of there, using uproar, and it hasn't been paralyzed yet until it finally ends. So what are we going to pull out of the bag next? After tanking a hit, it's jump kick, which gives us a win. Ingrain really saved us in that battle. I reckon it was impossible without it, but we clutched out a win. That wasn't even the toughest battle in the game, 10. There's still red. Funnily enough, like most other runs, Cantal leaders aren't worth talking about. We make sure to get leftovers, and that is a permanent fixture. It's not even for these gym leaders, really, but for the battle with red, which we will get to. I won't really waste time talking about blue because compared to everything else, it only takes around 30 minutes of attempts, so it's just here as background footage while we prep for red. Like maybe if this had been earlier on, he'd get a breakdown, but compared to Lance, this guy was a walk in the park. Sure, he has annoying moves like the Executor's Trick Room, which lets his Pokemon go first. Machamp's got no guard, which means its dynamic punch will never miss. We're at a pretty high level when all said and done, thanks to the gym battles and battling all the trainers across Kanto, so it simply requires a bit of trial and error. But let's talk about red. First and foremost, leftovers is mandatory. We are constantly pelted by hail this entire battle, and leftovers keeps us on an even keel. However, we now don't heal any HP per turn. We are neutral. Second, what level do we need to be? I tried this at multiple increments of 5 until it just made sense to just level all the way to 100. The name of the game is survivability. It does feel like there is a point of diminishing returns in how much damage we can resist though. I didn't see too much of a damage decrease after gaining 20 levels for something like Pikachu's Vault Tackle or Blastoise's Focus Blast. Whether there's some truth to that, I don't know. All I can say is that until level 100, we weren't making it past Blastoise before that. And I tried for hours, so trust me on that. Firstly, there's Pikachu. It'll be using Volt Tackle. If you're lucky, that thing won't do over half. If you're unlucky, it'll do over half and leave you paralyzed. Instant reset. If you get paralyzed by Pikachu's static ability, that's a reset. You ain't surviving. Due to this run, we've put Pikachu in perfect condition because it's a glass cannon and we are barely hitting it. Blastoise will always be the second Pokemon out. The order in which Red sends out Pokemon is overall pretty consistent. Focus Punch, that's why it's the Blastoise. It's a move we can tank, but not so much that we could take more than three of them before we're KO'd. Remember, we want to make it through Blastoise with decent HP because there are several Pokemon remaining. Sometimes it'll use Blizzard. It's weak, but you run the risk of getting frozen. Unless you throw out next turn, that's a reset. Honestly, Blastoise is predictable. Focus Blast can miss, but Venusaur, God, it's got Sleep Powder, and it will use that until it hits. Then your run's over. It'll then switch to Sludge Bomb, which does a ton of damage. And if you're not asleep, you run the risk of being poisoned. If you somehow make it past Venusaur, but look at that, it's often Charizard. Its moves can burn us. Air Slash and Flinch. 30% of runs end at Pikachu, 60% at Blastoise. The rest is mostly on the Charizard. We're just on such low HP that we can't survive to see what could happen. And it's the same with Lapras and Snorlax. I wish this was Gen 2 and Snorlax had rest, because we could buy ourselves some time. Instead, it's got a bunch of attacking moves, but I guess it doesn't have amnesia, so that's something. Through the hundreds and hundreds of battles, I was genuinely starting to believe this was not possible. There was just no give at any point. If there wasn't hail, and on occasion we get sunny day or rain dance, it still wasn't enough. There was just not one Pokemon in his team who'd give us a break. But I'd spent so much damn time on this run, I was far too stubborn to just let this go. I was just mindlessly tapping the A button for, for far too long while doing other stuff. I wish I could have set up auto fire or something, but then you might as well just have a bot do it, I guess. But we've come this far and eroded this much of our sanity, so what is a little more, eh? Now, I don't know what the odds of this battle were. I don't want to know. It's like some kind of natural phenomenon that defies explanation. You can only observe what happened, so let's observe. It begins like every other battle. Pikachu's out first. Our first move is for Sade. 70 base damage with Stab. Of course, that's a KO. Are we getting stacked? Nope. It's a solid start, but Blastoise is next. What has Metronome got in store for us? We roll the dice and get Dragon Rage. Barely does anything. Blizzard's the best we can hope for and it does 50-ish damage. I'm not holding out too much hope. Next turn, we roll Spike Cannon. Ordinarily, not a great move. Now though, it just keeps hitting and hitting, ending in 5 hits and a crit. 
And this is actually starting to morph into a pretty good position. All right, bring on Venusaur, where Run's going to die. But let's just miss with our first move and get put to sleep. Horn Drill, one hit KO. The way the calculations work with our level, that is a 43%-ish chance. That is wild. I've never gotten this far with this much HP before. A one hit KO move is just extremely rare. It's crazy. Three Pokemon down, three remaining. Charizard is next and that thing can put on the hurt. At least we get to go first. We use hidden power, it's neutral damage and does just under half. Charizard tags us with a flare blitz. It's not that effective and there's no burn. Okay, what's up next? We roll the dice, rock throw. Even with trash accuracy we hit. That is some great luck. Like having this HP at this stage is insane. All right, all right, Lapras. I have barely seen this thing. We've got no stat boosts, no ingrain, we can tank a few hits, I guess. Metronome gives us Howl. Could be worse, I guess. Lapras's Blizzard is doing a bit more damage than Blastoise's, and that's not what I want to see. Leftovers is just keeping us above half HP too. Then Heal Order comes in and takes us back to full health. Extremely lucky. Another Blizzard from Lapras. Please no freeze. Good stuff. Metronome gives us Guillotine. Another one hit KO move. I was speechless. Don't want to think about the odds. So technically, it just has as much chance as any other move going up. Either way, there's one Pokemon left and we are in great shape. Snorlax is out, it has Blizzard, and its special moves aren't going to do as much as Lapras, so as long as there's no Freeze, and it prefers going for Blizzard because it'll always hit, we are in with a chance. I just want us to get some attacking moves off, and we do, but they're not great. Don't get me wrong, we get off a Howl and eventually bulk up, but when we're not attacking or getting hit with physical moves, it's not helping. And then Red goes and uses a full restore on Snorlax. We next pull off a charm, lowering Snorlax's attack, but it's still using Blizzard. But then I see that we use Flare Blitz. Our attack is pretty high, and though we're putting up big numbers, that is far too much recoil damage we've taken. On 88 HP, we're then hit with Blizzard. We are on 52 HP. One more hit from Snorlax with the chip damage will finish us off, no doubt. Another full restore. This ain't happening. No way. We're just not outputting enough damage. We have two chances at best. First metronome gives a slam, surely it's not gonna be a one shot and defeat Snorlax handing us the victory against Red. Honestly, not quite sure what to say after all that. It was a long frustrating run, there were some massive highs and some low lows. I don't think I ever want to do another run like that again, but Red was kind of the ultimate test so I don't know what you'd get from any other trainer in a vanilla game to be honest. Could I have chosen a better Pokemon for the run? Maybe something with better defenses? I don't know. Arceus' speed and its attacking stats carried us through some really tough battles though, so but who knows. But hey, maybe you could have made the run even easier, feel free to let me know. If you have an idea for an interesting run in the same style, let me know. And if you want to like, subscribe, go for it. Until next time, have a good one.